Now let's move on to discuss the bones of the lower extremity, including the upper leg bone, the bones of the lower leg, as well as the bones of the ankle and foot. The first bone of the lower extremity we'll discuss is the femur or thigh bone. It's shown here in this anterior view. At the proximal end is the articular surface of the head, which articulates with the hip bone. There's also a greater trochanter and a neck. There's also a lesser trochanter, a men du charchat. The head of the femur articulates with the acetabulum of the hip bone. The neck of the femur joins the shaft at an angle of approximately 125 degrees. The surface features of the femur include, number one, the greater trochanter. This projects laterally from where the neck and the shaft join. Number two, the lesser trochanter. This is located on the posterior medial surface of the femur and similarly to the greater trochanter are tendon attachment points. Number three, the gluteal tuberosity. This is the attachment point for the pectinus muscle and the gluteus maximus muscle. At the distal end of the femur are the lateral and medial epicondyles as well as the lateral and medial condyles. The interchondrular fossa are the sites of anterior and posterior cruciate ligament attachments. On the inferior surface, the condyles form the articular surface with elevated borders on which the patella bone articulates and glides. The next bone we'll discuss is a patella or kneecap, and it's shown here in this lateral view of a bent knee. The patella forms in the quadriceps tendon and is also attached to the patellar ligament. The patella contains a base as well as an apex. The patella or kneecap is a large sesamoid bone that articulates with the femur and glides over the anterior articular surface of the femur. The anterior and posterior surfaces of the patella are joined laterally by a thinner margin on the outside that thickens towards the middle of the bone. The patella forms within the quadriceps tendon, and the upper portion of the bone has a broad, roughened surface for the attachment of the quadriceps tendon. Towards the lower apex of the bone is the attachment point for the patellar ligament. The first bone of the lower leg we'll discuss is the tibia. Shown in this anterior view, the tibia has a medial and lateral condyle, also a tibial tuberosity. The shaft of the tibia leads to the inferior articular surface at the distal end. There is also a medial malleolus. The tibia bone is the medial bone of the lower leg. The tibia is expanded in its proximal end where it enters the knee joint and narrows in the shaft. The tibia articulates with the femur bone at its medial and lateral condyles. The patellar ligament is attached to the tibial tuberosity. On the lateral margin of the tibia is the interosseous border where a collagenous sheet connects the tibia to the medial margin of the fibula bone. At the distal end of the tibia, the medial malleolus supports the articulation between the tibia and the talus bone of the ankle. The popliteus and soleus muscles attach to the tibia on the posterior surface on the soleal line. The second bone of the lower leg is the fibula. The fibula contains a head, shaft, and a lateral malleolus. The fibula or calf bone is on the lateral side of the tibia. The fibula bone articulates with the tibia at both ends. The proximal articulation is between the fibular head and the inferior and posterior surface of the lateral tibial condyle. The distal articulation is between the lateral malleolus of the fibula and the distal lateral surface of the tibia. The fibula bone and the tibia bone are connected through a collagenous sheet that connects the tibia to the medial margin of the fibula bone. The fibula is not involved in the knee joint, but it does contribute to the stability of the ankle joint. 
at the distal end of the bone, the lateral malleolus prevents the tibia bone from sliding across the surface of the talus bone. The bones of the ankle. The tarsus or ankle is made up of the talus bone, the calcaneus bone, the cuboid, navicular bone, and three cuneiform bones. The following is a description of each bone. Number one, the talus. The talus is the second largest bone in the ankle next to the calcaneus bone. This bone transmits the weight of the body through the foot towards the toes. It articulates with the tibia and fibula at the trochlea of the talus, the lateral malleolus of the fibula, and the medial malleolus of the tibia bone. The talus also articulates with the deeper calcaneus bone of the ankle. The following is a clinical note on ankle sprain. An ankle sprain is a common injury of the ankle in which one or more ligaments are torn completely or partially. The ligament most frequently damaged in a sprained ankle is the anterior talofibular ligament. This type of injury to the ankle is usually caused by rolling or turning the foot beyond its normal limits. Ankle sprains can be classified from grade 1 to 3 based on their severity. A grade 1 sprain involves minimal damage to the ligament fibers, whereas a grade 3 sprain involves a complete tear and joint instability. A sprained ankle can be diagnosed based on symptoms, physical exam, and an x-ray to rule out a fracture in the ankle bone. The treatment for an ankle sprain includes rest, ice, compression and elevation, a cast and longer term immobilization is required for a severe sprain to the ankle joint. Clinical Challenge Exam Question The tarsus or ankle is made up of a number of different bones, and these bones articulate with the bones of the lower leg as well as the bones of the foot. Which of the following statements about the tarsal bones is correct? A. There are a total of nine tarsal bones. B. The tarsal bones are held in position by friction and external forces. C. The largest tarsal bone is the cuneiform bone. D. There are three cuneiform bones in the tarsus that articulate with metatarsal bones. Or E. None of the answers are correct. Here's the answer to the question. This question tests your knowledge of the anatomy of the tarsus. The correct answer for this question is D. There are three cuneiform bones in the tarsus that articulate with metatarsal bones. The second tarsal bone we'll discuss is the calcaneus. This is the largest tarsal bone that makes up the heel of the foot. And the majority of the body weight in a standing position passes through this bone into the ground. The posterior surface has an attachment point for the calcaneum tendon or the Achilles tendon. This is attached to the calf muscles. The third bone is the cuboid. This articulates with the calcaneus bone on the anterior lateral surface. The fourth tarsal bone is the navicular bone. It's located on the medial side of the ankle and articulates with the anterior surface of the talus and the three cuneiform bones. And number five are the cuneiform bones. These are wedge-shaped bones in a row known as medial, intermediate, and lateral cuneiform bones. They're located between the navicular and the first three metatarsal bones. And these bones articulate with the navicular bone and along with the cuboid, the metatarsal bones. The bones of the foot. As shown in this dorsal view of the foot, adjacent to the cuneiform bones and the cuboid bone are the five metatarsal bones, and they're numbered one through five. There are also proximal phalanges, intermediate phalanges, and distal phalanges. The foot is made up of five metatarsal bones and the phalange bones. The metatarsals 
are similar to the metacarpal bones of the hand. They're numbered 1 to 5, beginning on the medial side of the foot. The metatarsal bones are convex long bones that have a shaft, base, and a head. The first, second, and third bones articulate with the three cuneiform bones. And the fourth and fifth metatarsal bones articulate with the cuboid bone. At their distal end, each metatarsal bone articulates with one proximal phalange bone. The phalange bones of the foot are arranged in rows, a proximal row, an intermediate, and a distal row. The big toe or hallux has only a proximal and distal phalange bone. The other four toes have a proximal, intermediate, and distal phalange bone. These bones of the foot articulate in diarthrosis joints, and these joints permit flexion and extension, adduction and abduction movements. Normally, the underside of the foot contains arches. The foot arches are the longitudinal arch, which is marked with a blue arrow in the above image, and the transverse arch, which is marked with a broad red arrow. These arches help contour to uneven surfaces during walking, and they distribute the weight of the body. The longitudinal arch transfers weight along the foot, and this arch is maintained by ligaments and tendons, which tie the calcaneus bone to the distal portions of the metatarsal bones. Typically, while standing, the lateral side of the foot carries the majority of the body weight. The degree of curvature changes from the medial side to the lateral side of the foot, and this forms the transverse arch. The following is a clinical note on a condition that involves the arches of the foot, flat feet. Having flat feet is a condition in which the normal arches of the feet collapse, resulting in almost the entire sole of the foot coming in contact with the ground. In approximately 20% of the population, the arches never develop as expected. In children, the presence of baby fat masks the actual normal arch of their feet. In adults, flat feet can occur due to injury, illness, unusual stress on the feet, and faulty biomechanics. This condition can be easily diagnosed by visual inspection of the feet while the individual is standing. Treatment is usually necessary in individuals with associated foot, lower leg, knee, or back pain. The treatment includes special orthotic footwear and specific foot exercises. There are differences in skeletal structure between humans. The main differences between the structure and physical characteristics of the skeletal system in humans are between males and females. The following are some of the differences based on sex of the individual. The skull. In males, the skull is heavier with a more sloping forehead and larger sinuses. Also, the mandible and teeth are larger. There's differences in the pelvis. In males, the pelvic inlet is heart-shaped, whereas in females, it's oval to round-shaped. There's also differences in the cossacks. In males, the cossack points anteriorly, and in the female, it points inferiorly. Bone markings. In general, the bone markings are more prominent in males as compared to females. Here are some additional differences in the human pelvis between males and females. In the male, the pelvis has a deeper iliac fossa and the acetabulum is directed laterally. Also, the ischial spine points medially and the sacrum forms a long, narrow triangular shape. In the female, the pelvis has a shallower iliac fossa and the acetabulum faces slightly anteriorly as well as laterally. In females, the ischial spine points posteriorly and the sacrum forms a broad, shorter triangular shape with less curvature. 